radar, computer models, and satellites. Oh my, the technology behind severe storm forecasting. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Harold Brooks, Senior Research Scientist at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. Welcome, Dr. Brooks. Hi, good to be here. So you've been at NOAA for a long time. Tell us about your background and uh, your experience in researching severe storms. Well, my undergraduate degree is actually physics and math, and I got into doing climate modeling for my uh, my master's degree and then switched into doing severe thunderstorm modeling starting from my PhD, and that was master's is from Columbia University, he's from the University of Illinois, and I started working on severe storms well, 30 something years ago now, and I have a researcher who's interested in the forecasting problems. Uh, and so that's part of a lot of why it comes, things come together. And then my climate background has brought me together. I bring the climate information in with severe storms research as well. What is the state of the art in severe weather prediction analysis and tracking technology today? Well, clearly on this, we have very different time scales that we care about. And on the very short time scales, sort of the next few minutes, things are going to be happening. Uh, we depend heavily on, on, on radar. Uh, and what we can see with with, with radar looking at storms. And uh, weather radar was actually de primarily developed here at the Sphere of Storms Lab back in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and now we use Doppler radar technology to allow us to see what's going on velocity-wise inside of the storm. And we're working on the next generation of radars. Um, they're called phased array radars, in which the, the radar actually doesn't have mechanical uh, parts. It has a series of small transmitters and receivers that we can electronically steer. You collect information over a, a much faster period of time over a wide, uh, wider area. Uh, and that, we'll see how long that takes to come online as the, as the official stuff, but hopefully that'll come along. Further out, we're dependent upon computer models and observations uh, of the atmosphere. Uh, the computer models now have horizontal grid spacings of maybe three kilometers. Uh, and they can actually start to resolve features of storms and we can start to see storms and how they behave and use those as forecasting. And those generally work out to, you know, 24 to 48 hours. And beyond that, we use statistical techniques a lot that start to look out. Maybe even now this year, there's been some experiments to work out two to three weeks in advance to say that general areas, and we, we, we can't say that a storm is going to hit a particular location, but the middle part of the country will be either really active or really inactive. And it looks like we're starting to make some headway on that kind of work. What role do satellites play? Well, satellites play a role, particularly in the numerical model uh, world, and that uh, those forecasts out to one to two days, we can use satellite information to put them into the models to help uh, get a better idea of what the initial conditions of the atmosphere are before we start running the model. Uh, they also can provide some checks on what's happening. And for when we're looking over what we consider large scales, which might be, say, the you know, half the size of the continent, it's easy to see you know, systems moving. Uh, when we're in on an individual thunderstorm, for instance, you know, we really care mostly about the radar, but on the larger scale and, and looking at storms begin to initiate, uh, satellite's pretty valuable for the forecasters. Summarize for us the different types of storm weather computer models in use today and the benefits of having so many different ones. Well, I think one of the big things that we, we get out of the, out of the different models is that, um, you know, there's that old saying that all models are wrong, but, but some are useful. And the models, we, we don't even fully understand in all cases why some of the models work better in some situations than in others. Uh, some of it has to do with you know, just the way that the, we don't know what the atmosphere looks like exactly, so there's always initial condition uncertainty, and that we can't resolve all the features inside of the, inside of the atmosphere, so we have to, what we call parameterize them to, to get the effects of those processes uh, as they go out on the larger scales. And so the fact that those models aren't perfect, having a variety of models allows us to get some idea of what the probable range of the atmospheric behavior today is and, and what's, the, what's likely, what's possible, uh, what's unlikely. And we can start to get an idea. And it's because you know, we just don't know everything we'd like to know. And we probably, in fact, the atmosphere scale we'd have to model that is so small, we'll never be at that place where we know everything exactly. What role is machine learning and artificial intelligence playing in weather forecasting today? Uh, today, it's, it's not doing a whole lot of, with, with machine learning, but that's certainly an area where there's a, a lot of research going on. Uh, how we can actually figure out you know, some of the real difficult aspects of the fact that the models aren't uh, 
learning how the models don't work and if the machine learning techniques allow us to pick up what the models do well. We've done a lot of statistical stuff in the past, but um, the machine learning things that are going on, there's been work particularly for hail forecasting that's it's promising. It's not what we call operational yet, but in the experimental stage, it looks like it works fairly well. Uh, now, the harder problems of things like what non-tornadic severe winds uh, look like, uh, they can, like the kinds of things that happened in Dallas uh, over the weekend, uh, those kinds of things is, is probably the next step because that's an extremely difficult forecast problem. Does social media play a role in helping scientists understand real-time weather? Social media, yes and no, it helps us understand what's going on. Uh, and actually, one of the big things I had a, a P, I have currently a PhD student that a couple, a few years ago, as part of her summer undergraduate, we actually saw how information spread on social media in severe storms. And we're attempting to figure out ways that we can leverage that to provide information that for for people that's actionable. Uh, and so it's not really, it's, in, in many cases, it is getting information in about what's occurring because you get some real time look at, you know, people's got a, people have a picture of you know, this is what happened at my house just now. But also trying to figure out how we can communicate back to people in a way that they make good decisions uh, and then allowing them to know what's going on uh, and how we can, I, I'd really like to do a little bit more work on what I, what I talk about is the grammar of social media that when you're thinking about say Twitter, how do we, you know, what's the right structure for a tweet that allows it to get retweeted by people most often that allows the information to come in. Do we need to do it in a, here's the, here's the weather event, here's where it is, here's the time, here's the possible impacts, or is there some other order to that structure that would allow us to communicate that better? And that's, I think, a really rich uh, area for research is essentially learning how to write effective tweets that can be, that can actually work well. You know, Harold, I think we all want to understand what's going to be the effective tweet, right? Whether yes. it's emojis or hashtags, but hopefully somebody's working on that. Um, so there are hundreds of weather storm radar and storm tracking apps that are out there right now. What features or technologies should consumers look for in apps to warn them about approaching severe weather? Well, I think one of the, one of the biggest things that they can look at, and this is one of the things that actually makes the, the, the U.S. system unique around the world is particularly the availability of radar data. Uh, the, many countries, you can't see radar data in real time, but there are a number of apps out there right now that you can actually look at, at radar data from any radar in the country uh, at, this, at you know, any time you want to. I can pick up and if I want to look at the radar out of Caribou, Maine right now, I can do that and see what's going on in Maine. Uh, and you can actually see both the the reflectivity, so what the precipitation looks like out of the storm, you can see velocity, and you can have overlaid on that any warning information that, that exists, uh, so you can actually see what's going on and see what the weather forecasts look like that are associated with that. So I think, to me, getting as, as close to the, I don't want to say raw radar data because it's actually still processed pretty heavily, uh, but getting down to that, that radar data is, is good. You also want to make sure you've got something that that provides, that allows you to control which products you want to, you want to get information from. Uh, that there are, I mean, I'm, I don't particularly care about things like dense fog advisories. I don't really need to be told that's happening. But I care things about, you know, there's a tornado warning, there's a flash flood warning, there's a severe thunderstorm warning. Um, some winter products I care about a lot, and I want to be able to t tailor which of those products I hear that, that affect where, what I do in my life. Uh, you know, I don't work outside, so there's a lot of stuff with outside weather that, you know, most of the day I don't really care, but I may really want to know for short periods of times in the, in the morning and the afternoon. What technology advances are on the horizon that might push storm prediction accuracy forward to that next level? I, I think one of the big things we're, we're really actually looking at a lot is, the, is we've developed models over the last several years that ingest radar data, and then we can essentially make an ensemble of, of, of forecasts, make a, a large number of computer model forecasts using that radar data and look forward just an hour or two and be able to actually look at how storms are going to behave in that short term uh, and actually, in fact, look at how storms are going to develop, storms that don't even exist yet, uh, how, they're, how they're going to develop. Uh, that's a real, that's, I think, a really, the big thing. We call it worn on forecast, uh, and it's a project that will hopefully change the way we think about forecasts. Uh, we're also doing some things that go sort of down more towards, in some, some sense, the social science end of it. What kind of information can we provide you 
and for, or provide an emergency manager or provide someone else, what kind of information do they need that helps them make a decision more effectively? We recognize that the decision-making problem for people in times of uncertainty, there's a lot of other stuff going on. You're worried about your family, you're worried about pets, you're worried about, you know, where am I right now? And so we know that we have to find ways to provide information quickly that you can make that's effective for making decisions with. And that the kind of information that you need or I need or my next door neighbor needs or the hospital administrator needs may be really, really different. And so how do we actually make that information available in ways that people can actually use it? Dr. Harold Brooks, Senior Research Scientist at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. If somebody wants to connect with you, maybe it's Jack trying to figure out how to make Twitter better and uh, track storms, how can they do that? I think actually probably the, the, the best way in many ways is, is my Twitter handle, at hebrooks87. Uh, I'm also, you can look at the National Severe Storms Lab website, uh, and I'm, I'm, what we do as a, as a group is reflected there. You may find it hard to find me individually at times, but the laboratory does a lot of interesting stuff. Thanks again. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.